The double is a sequel to a book called The Cut. And if you have not read that, I just want to talk about the character a little bit. Um, uh, Spiro Lucas is a Marine who fought in Fallujah, came back to DC, and got a job as an investigator for a criminal defense attorney, which is actually a, a common thing in Washington anyway. A lot of these attorneys hire um, men and women who serve in the Middle East. And even the agencies, uh, some of the agencies do the same. And the reason is, is because they're suited for a job. Uh, they're not afraid to go into neighborhoods and where they have to go to talk to people. And, but beyond that, they're also um, people who want to, in, in a way, they want to replicate that experience they had in the war. And by that, I, I don't mean the violent aspect of it. What I mean is that when you're in the theater of war and you're in the military, you get up and you have a mission every day. You have a uh, purpose. You give, you're given orders. And they've gotten used to that, uh, and they get it from this job also. The other uh, thing that I gave this character is uh, I had him taking jobs on the side where he recovers lost and stolen property for a fee of 40% of the value. And if you're my age or older, you recognize that this is, comes directly from um, John D. McDonald, Travis McGee, which was the first crime novel I ever read, The Deep Blue Goodbye. And if you haven't read it, it's a really deep novel. And I recently reread it, and it's just an extraordinary book. The Travis McGee series is really great. Um, Lucas is also a guy who is making up for his lost time where he was in the service with women. And uh, he, he wants to, you know, he likes to sleep with as many of them as he can. Uh, he doesn't just like women, he likes them in bed. And it gets him in trouble. Um, in the first book, it was kind of just sort of glanced off of him a little bit. But in this book, he uh, meets, sees a woman in a bar in the beginning of the book. And he says to himself, uh, she looked like a 60s movie star imported from Sweden or Italy. And right away, you know, he's talking about somebody who looks like Sophia Loren, Ursula Andress, or the American counterpart, Anne Margaret. And he just falls, he just falls for her. So he makes a date with her. He meets her in a hotel bar, and he knows five minutes into the date that she's married. And the kind of guy that he is, he doesn't care. He goes upstairs with her. Um, <coughs> Something happens, it's like uh, fire and gasoline. You're just totally supercharged. It's uh, one of those things that if you're lucky enough for it to happen in your life, it happens. But he falls in love with her. And um, his brother Leo says to him, don't fall in love with somebody you can't have. That's exactly what it does, what he does. And, um, and there's uh, problems that come out of that. Um, the crime fiction aspect of the book, he's working a couple cases. And one of them is uh, a woman asked him to retrieve a painting that was stolen from her by a guy named Billy King. And King's MO is that he is, a, um, is also uh, a stud in the bedroom, and he, uh, he dominates women. And then he chews them up, spits them out, he rips them off and leaves. He's a sexual predator. And uh, the, the painting is called The Double. Okay, so the painting is based on a painting that hangs in my house called Double Portrait by Minerva Chapman, who's an American Impressionist. And it's of two guys standing next to each other. Um, and the backgrounds, even though they're next to each other, their backgrounds are different, which always told me that the painting is about the duality of one man. And in the book, uh, Billy King obviously is Lucas's dope founder. He's the dark side of Lucas. Um, the art directors at Little Brown, helpfully on the cover, you got a guy and then his shadow, you know, it's his dark side. Um, uh, and so Lucas figures out that he has to destroy this guy, his dope gun, and violence ensues. <laughs> so that's the double. Um, what I would like to read tonight is sort of a thing that speaks to his character. Uh, Spiro uh, came back from the Middle East. He's obviously got PTSD. He's in denial of it. And he's got a lot of problems. And you see it in his actions. Um, and he goes, often goes to Walter Reed Army Medical Center, which up until about a year ago was just a mile from my house. And I go there frequently. And he visits people. And uh, he visits a friend of his that's getting worked on. And then he goes to another building and he sits down with the shrink. And he's there to talk about his friend, but she really pushes the conversation towards him and what's going on with him. And she asks him, what happened to the guys in, in your unit that you served with? And he doesn't give it up, but he gives it up to you, the reader. He tells you what happened to him. And then when he's walking out of there, 
he sees a woman sitting by a door crying. And it was actually a common sight at the hospital because families were on site while their children were being worked on. And when they're around their kids, they always had a good game face on. But when you saw them alone, sometimes you'd see them breaking down. And Lucas says he does, uh, is in his character, he deals with that by thinking of a woman he's going to have a date with. So he always deflects in that direction. So this is a, um, um, a brief passage from the double. Valeria crossed one leg over the other and sat back in her chair. You still keep in touch with Marquise Rollins? Yes, yeah, said Lucas, feeling himself smile. I see Marquise up at the American Legion in Silver Spring every so often. We talk on the phone. Is he getting around okay on that leg of his? It's part of him now. Lucas had a plastic knee and a titanium shin pole for a left leg. It had replaced the leg that had been amputated. After an RPG had sent a piece of shrapnel, large as a mobile phone circa 1990, into his thigh and caused irreparable infection. What about the other guys in your outfit, said O'Leary. What's become of them? Some came back in caskets, thought Lucas. They're buried in Metairie, Louisiana, in Houston, and they're on to Virginia. Solomon King is a top car salesman at a Ford dealership in Overland, Kansas. Greg Evans works in Pennsylvania, filling orders for an internet retailer. Rick McKenzie is in a federal prison somewhere out west doing 20 to life for stabbing a man to death in a Missoula bar. David Hess is unemployed, living in his parents' basement in Galveston. Last time Lucas talked to him, Lawson Cochran had married a stripper after a long night of Milwaukee's best and an ounce of crystal meth. Ronald Wilson re-enlisted and was serving in Afghanistan. Alfred Turner went back to college for a law degree. Joey Fabiano hung himself from the rafters of a law cabin in Colorado. I don't know, said Lucas. I guess I haven't been in touch with him lately. I should try. O'Leary <coughs> looked at him directly. And how are you? I'm fine. Everything's going well. That's good to hear. No worries, said Lucas. Dr. O'Leary picked up a book that was sitting on her desk and let Lucas see its cover. It was the popular, recently published memoir written by Chris Kyle, a celebrated Navy SEAL sniper who'd served in Iraq. Have you read this? Lucas shook his head. It was given to me by a client. I saw the author interviewed on Bill O'Reilly's show. I met Chris Kyle when he was shooting in Fallujah, said Lucas. Apparently, he had 150 confirmed kills, said O'Leary. On O'Reilly, he claimed to have no remorse for the lives he took, including women. Do you find that odd? Not particularly, said Lucas. Kyle took out 150 enemy combatants who would have killed countless American Marines and soldiers if they had the chance. That Texan saved a lot of lives. By taking lives. Yes, Lucas gripped the arm of his chair. Spiro, are you all right? Why? You seem disturbed. Not at all, man. You should make an appointment and come in. I'm straight. Anyway, I'm not exactly the type who, you know, sits in a room and discusses his feelings. Doesn't mean there's something wrong with you if you do. A brief silence settled between them. You're a good person, Olivia. I think you are, too. Lucas pushed himself up from his chair and stood to his height. Take care, Doc. You take care. On the way out of the building, he passed a woman, early in her middle age, seated in a chair outside a room with a closed door. She had a towel wrapped around one bloodless hand and was pressed against her face. Her eyes were pink and swollen, and there were mascara tracks on her cheeks. He had heard her deep sobs from far down the hall. He guess she'd been crying for some time. He'd seen her kind here before, another war-torn soldier's mom. Walking on, he thought of the woman he was about to meet for drinks. <coughs> Sex took his mind off the stink of death. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A um, couple things about that. Um, the, uh, the paragraph where he talks about his buddies, what happened to him, that just came out of, I was in a van in uh, New Orleans with an actor who was uh, one of the first Marines in Iraq, and I asked him, what happened to your buddies? And he just told me, he went down the list. And if you're being, if you want to be didactic, you would just, in, in, a, in a passage like this, you would just list the bad things. But the fact of the matter is, some of these guys, um, 
ended up, you know, becoming lawyers and teachers and that sort of thing. And others went to prison and hung themselves. And, <coughs> and the interesting thing is, why, what does war um, do? Why does war affect some people like that and not others? And some of the, um, one of the things that is coming to light now that's really pretty new is that they're seeing people with PTSD who didn't even, weren't even on a battlefield. You're seeing these people that operate the drones coming back with severe P PTSD, which indicates that the thing that messes you up is the taking of another human life. It's not being under fire and all those other things that they thought that it, it was. Um, another thing from this passage is I mentioned Chris Kyle. After I wrote this book, Chris Kyle was shot to death by another veteran who he was trying to help. Um, he took him hunting. And the guy turned his rifle on Chris and murdered him. And this was a veteran who um, had been trying to get help, and with all the red tape and so on, was not was not being uh, attended to. So that's just sort of a postscript to the um, to the passage that I read. Anyway, um, let me now just wing it a little bit and uh, tell you because I'm sure that there's many aspiring writers in here, and um, my. Uh, my process of how I got here and so on is probably a lot different than, than a lot of people that you're going to see up here. Um, uh, until I became a writer, I had never met a writer before. And I, I think I came to the New York once in my life, the World's Fair. My dad took me when I was a little boy. And I had never been in New York after that. So I didn't know anybody. Couldn't, uh, no agents, you know, didn't come to the parties, all that stuff. I just wanted to write a book, and I did it. And I sent it up to New York uh, blind. I sent it to one publisher, St. Martin's Press. And the old writer's market book that I was using as a source said, um, you know, no simultaneous submissions. Just send it to one publisher. And that's the stupidest thing you can do. But I did it. That's, I did it. I was following the rules. And um, anyway, a year later, they called me up and said they just picked it up off the slush pile. They is Gordon Van Gelder, a young editor there, who's now the uh, editor and publisher of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Great guy. And uh, they bought it, and I started writing books. Uh, you know, I continue to write books, and uh, the advances are very low. I had a I had a uh, a day job. I, I got a job in a little uh, film distribution company in D.C. because I was always wanted to be a filmmaker. And um, and then um, you know I did that for for eight years. I wrote a book a year at night and very early in the morning while I worked the day job. And then one of my books sold to Miramax, and I tied myself as the writer to that screenplay. And they didn't make the film, but the but the script got around as it does, it becomes a calling card. And I started getting work as a uh, script doctor. And then um, in uh, a couple of years later, David Simon called me up because. His girlfriend, Laura Lippman, who I think has spoke here before, a great writer out of Baltimore, she had handed him one of my books, The Sweet Forever, and said, look, read this, this guy's doing in D.C. what you're doing in, in Baltimore, <coughs> meaning I was writing about the social side of crime. And uh, so I happened to run into him at a funeral of a mutual friend. I didn't really know him. And he says, ride back with me to the awake. And I did, and he, he said, I just sold a... Um, a show to HBO about cops and drug dealers. That's all he said. You know, he didn't like blow it up and make it grandiose or anything like that. Would you like to write an episode? I said, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> I wrote um, the uh, episode where Wallace is killed by his friends in the first season of The Wire, <coughs> and then I was in, and I ended up being a producer and writer on that show for five, full five years. Um, and always, my unofficial contract with Simon was that I would always get the penultimate episode. Uh, meaning the episode where everybody gets killed. <laughs> so, not the one where they go to church and talk about their feelings. <laughs> Which the other writers hate, you know, but <laughs> too bad. <laughs> um, and I've been doing that ever since. I've been writing a book every year and working in television uh, for the balance of the year. Uh, and <clears throat> that's what I've been, how I've been juggling this thing. So, um, it's, it's a little bit different uh, than, than what you're probably used to hearing, but it, there's a lot of different roads, you know, just like there's just like there's a different way to make a family, right? There's all sorts of different ways to make a family. There's a lot of different ways to become a writer and, and make a living in this business. So um, I will open it up for questions. 
and we can talk about any of those things, and I don't mind talking about television either, if you're interested in that. Okay, yes? Just curious, um, who did your distribution company were you at when you released John Wu's The Killer? Uh, Circle Films. Uh, it's a little company in D.C. run by a couple of Greek guys who own movie theaters down there, the Pettis Brothers, and they had produced um, the early Coen Brothers films while I was working there. But sometimes uh, it gets blown up in the press that I was the producer of the Coen Brothers films. No, I was the guy who was answering the phone saying, Circle Films, how can I direct your call? <laughs> um, but I did distribute The Killer and a lot of other foreign films back when there was a market for that. And it was a real interesting way to learn the business. I ended up producing movies with them, a couple of independent films. And uh, one that was shot here in New York called Caught by Robert Young. And, um, you know, I learned the business. So when I got on the other side of it, and I would walk into a room and, and uh, I already knew how to, what contracts meant and that sort of thing. I had an education, so I was a, I had an advantage when I busted into the other side of things. Okay, yes. Me? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. The detail that you enrich your early books, I, I think you're early. I mean, you grew up in sort of the Greek immigrant neighborhood of DC, right? Yeah. And, but but the, the, the music, the musicians, the the LPs or the the shops where they bought their discs, the cars, the types of cars. Yeah. What you, is that all in your head, or did you have to do any research in order to make, in order to embroider the story? Actually, the, the <coughs> books, uh, the books that are set in the seventies, I didn't do any research on because it it is, all it's all in my head. Yeah. yeah. You know how when you're when you're a teenager, you you remember that the rest of your life, everything. More than I can remember what happened last year in my life. You know what I mean? I just, I and, um, but I was always a music freak. You know, I was really, I mean, a lot of things happened in my life that were very fortuitous in me becoming a writer. One of them was working in my dad's diner, Greek diner, when I was a kid. And um, in the late 60s, I started, I was 11 years old. And my dad and I, Greek, Greek Americans, an all black crew. And then because it was 68, and it is south of the Mason-Dixon line, the other side of the counter were white people wearing ties, white percussionists. So there was that always going on that I didn't understand intellectually, but I sure did know that that counter was a dividing line. You know? And then my dad would let the help play whatever they wanted on the radio. So what they play, they played. We had two soul stations on the AM dial, uh, WOK and WOL. And because it was where it was, it wasn't Motown that was playing, it was Stax Volt. So I was falling in love with that music. And also, the whole decade is, a, is an amazing decade of music because you've got soul and funk, rock, it's all playing on top 40 radio too at the same time. And then you got punk, you got disco, all these things happen in, in the decade. So, yep, very lucky, yeah. And uh, what it was, you sort of tease Stefanos and Strange working together. I just yep. wondered if we're gonna get a Stefanos Strange book. I did set that up at the end of the, um, they're working together, and, and you know he says we got a case. That's the last line of the, uh, of the book. So yeah, I think I probably will. With but I, there's commerce in, is involved too. So I have to, I have to uh, think about what my publisher wants me to do. And um, but you know what it was was written out of contract. It was just a book I wrote during the summer when I had a few months off, and nobody knew I was writing it. And then um, my my editor liked it, and my agent liked it, everybody liked it, so it got published. I think that's the way I would probably write a strange Stefanos book also. And I kind of like writing in a, in a fever like that, where you just, uh, you know, nobody's looking over your shoulder. You just have an idea and you just sit down and do it. It makes losing uh, Terry Quinn a little more palatable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I was wondering, Ed, when you're talking to veterans or policemen about kind of heavy stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the problems that I have is because, you know, you meet these people, you talk to them, you sort of want to pull things out of their brain, but is there a certain amount of guilt that you're using it for, even if you're, you know, you're, you're relating to them as human beings, but yet, is there a certain amount of guilt that, hey, I'm harvesting material from them also, once you get outside of your brain? Yeah. I, I wrote an essay about it in the Wire book that was published about how, um, you know, I would go home at night after being in those neighborhoods to my nice house, with, in my protected house, and my, driving my nice car home. And I made my living from that. And um, 
and I, I admit that I'm always working. You know, if I say to you, um, I do a lot. Of, I do a lot of work in juvenile <coughs> prisons and adult prisons. I go and do reading programs and stuff like that. And that sounds like, wow, you know, he's a great guy. But actually, yeah, well, that was, I'm getting a lot of material too. I'm always working. And if I do some good along the way, that's cool too. But believe me, I'm the wheels are always turning, and um, I, I don't. I, I'm aware of it, but I wouldn't say that I have guilt. Um, I'm just aware of it. Okay. When you wrote that first book that you just sent off, and then you waited uh -huh. a year. Um, what, what, how old were you and what did you do for the year when you just waited? Were you anxious or what, 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 what I was, at that time, I was uh, bartending in a, um, all this stuff helps. Like, I, I took a job in a bar down in Second C, which is right near the federal courts. And uh, I was in the kitchen, I ran the kitchen during the day, but at night I was by the bartend. And I, all, all these cops and judges and lawyers would be sitting there talking about their day. And I was, I was fly on the wall, as a bartender is. And, Every, every job I've had, um, it, you know, Jonathan knew I was going to get this in. I sold women's shoes for many years. And it was the great, best job I ever had. Do you want to tell us why? I think they know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I sold electronics, stereos, and all sorts of stuff. And it gave me social skills of how to talk to people, but more importantly, how to listen. The one thing that a lot of salesmen screw up is that they talk themselves out of sale, they talk too much. But my MO is that I just kind of shut up and listen to people, let them talk in, talk themselves into the deal, you know? And to this day, I'm really, I'm not that gregarious, but when I go out to, to talk with cops and people like that, I just say, you know, I might say, so just tell me what's going on. And, and then I just sit back and let them, because most of them want to talk to you. So what did you do? Uh, did you then think there's nothing else to do for the sale? How, how did you approach the, your book going off into the world and waiting? Well, it was, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to St. Martin's for publishing me. They published my first five novels. And, um, uh, and, and because nobody except Gordon was really watching me because the money was so small, I don't think anybody ever paid any attention to what I was doing, so I was learning how to write. And those five books, you can see an evolution get culminating in the big blowdown, which is sort of a big gangster novel written in the third person. The Nick Sabanis books are first person books, which were, was a crush, a crush for me in a way. I had to get past that. And then um, I gave myself time because, I mean, I gave myself a, a limit because I had kids, I had babies coming in at, at that time, and, um, and I didn't want to be one of those guys who made his family suffer because he wanted to be a writer. So I said to myself, well, if this doesn't work out in a few years, I'll just do whatever. I mean, I, I'm a good salesman. I'll, I'll always provide for my family. And, um, but then I, I wrote a book called King Sucker Man, which went to Little Brown, and for much considerably more money, and that put me in a different position and, and allowed me to keep going. And, um, you know, that's, that's how it worked out. How's your uh, process evolved from book to book as far as outlining or planning? Did you, do you find the way you wrote maybe a fire in the fence to be very different from the cut? Or yeah, that, well, the fire in the fence was different than all of them because I didn't know what I was doing. It's the first thing I ever tried to write. And I wrote that book in longhand in notebooks, which were other twice. Um, but since then, I've adhered to a pretty strict formula. Um, I write um, seven days a week when I'm writing a novel, and I work two shifts, uh, a day shift to a late lunch, and then I go out and do something physical around my bike or kayak or something like that to forget about it. Come back at night, and I rewrite what I did during the day, and I'm ready to go forward the next morning. So my first draft is a draft that's been continually rewritten the whole time. And by working seven days a week, I can stay in that tunnel, that creative tunnel that you need to stay in. Because I found early on that when you take a weekend off, you're, you're screwed on Monday morning. You're sitting around wondering, what, what do I do now? It's got to be a continuous, for me, process. And then so I can get a book done in about four or five months usually. But all the research is front loaded. So the first two months is just me going out there and, uh, Bring, bring information in. Yes? What 
What would you say is the major difference between writing a novel and writing for TV or writing a screenplay? Um, well, I take, uh, let me just say this, I take them both equally seriously. Because we've had novelists come in to our writer's room who have actually said, this is going to be easy. And they didn't, they didn't last. You know, it's not easy. We, split, we sweat as much blood over that as we do. Um, it's, it's a different style of writing. Um, it's action and dialogue, obviously. There's no internal monologue. And you can't really meander because it's got to be up on screen. Whatever you write has to be up on screen. Um, and, it, and it forces you to be more disciplined. It's, it's, a little, it's a little tricky. And you also have to write for production. So you're thinking about that. Um, and you're writing for actors. You, you, once you get to know them, you're thinking about that also. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of filters that go, you know, when I write a book, it's me and my editor. And then the book goes, and then the book goes out in the world, whatever we do together. But on television, it's not just collaboration in the writer's room. First of all, you get rewritten. Because a showrunner always rewrites your work. Because the, the, all the scripts have to sound like they're written by one person. And that, that's how it works. Now you can beat that by writing in that guy's voice, which is what I eventually did on The Wire. Um, I, my first script for The Wire, I got about 30% of what I wrote made it to the screen. And I called David up and I said, what happened to my script? And he said, well, you're actually kind of lucky because if you get 30%, you're, you're, you know, you're fortunate. So you know, a lot of novelists at that point, they head for the door. They're not used to that. But it sort of put a chip on my shoulder, and I, I said to myself, well, okay, next time I'm going to get 50%. I'm going to figure this out. And by the time of um, I wrote episode 311, it's called Middle Ground. It's kind of the famous episode where they, they hunt down uh, Stringer Bell, Elmore and Brother Mazzone. Um, that was about 95% of me. You know, I finally got it. And one of the ways I got it was I figured out what Simon wanted. And, and what, uh, instead of writing stuff that he was going to cut out, I didn't write that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, go ahead. You've been two shifts of writing since I've been a mechanical question, but mm -hmm. how many hours in the morning can you sustain generally, and how many in the evening? Like well, until I, get, until I get too hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. It's, uh, because once you eat lunch, you're done. <laughs> so let's say 1, 2 o'clock, maybe 9 to 1. And then come back and uh, you know seven to ten. I eat, I eat a late dinner. I never turn the TV set on until ten o'clock at night. Oh yeah, I eat dinner at the end of the night, the very end of the night. No alcohol either. You know, of course, no television. It's all right. You don't miss much. <laughs> Go ahead. You don't have to deal with the other aspects of your life too much. You can carve. Like, do you have to? Keep well, I've been an awful father, basically. <laughs> um, you know, it's. I, I, it's an unusual way to live your life, and for the family also. That's all I'll say, but they're used to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Did you just start right off with a novel, or did you do any short fiction? No, the, the, A Firing Offense was the first thing I ever tried to write fiction, anything. I had confidence, um, and, and I was completely in the dark, so it was... I was naive, and that helped me, I think, um, not knowing. I have so many people come to me, and they say they want, they want the name of my agent, or they want to know what parties to go to, and I can't help them. I didn't know that either. Um, I just felt like, I felt like I had a story to tell, one, one story. I didn't know I was going to make a career out of this. I had the story in my head for 10 years, and I just wanted to see if I could do it. And, you know, it was something, um, to prove, I have my book on the spine in, in a library somewhere, my name on the spine. It was a big deal to me. I wanted that, you know, because that's your, I mean, I think writers are really um, silly about this, but they're trying to be mortality. And of course they never can, but that's how they think they can. You know, my book will be out, the spine out in the library somewhere in 100 years when I'm just not here. Before you got to writing that first novel, you wrote a lot of fiction. Crime I fiction, did, yeah. Johnny I, McDonald. Uh, John, well, I took a class in crime fiction at the University of Maryland my senior year, I, and I had not read books fiction before that really at all, and it turned me on to that genre. And I uh, then decided that's what I wanted to do. I was a film major, 
So I read books for the next 10 years, as many as I could, crime, all crime fiction, until I felt like I, it's, I thought I figured it out. Of course I hadn't, but I had then had the confidence to try it. Um, I no longer read much crime fiction at all, because I'm trying to catch up with all the fiction that I should have been reading earlier. Did you read Richard Stark and Donald Wood? I did, Westlake? yeah, yeah. I love Richard Stark. And I knew Westlake at the end, yeah. While you're writing, can you read fiction, or do you consider the instruction about what you Yeah, I can read it. I don't have a problem Doesn't with that. Doesn't interrupt. No. Yes, sir. Uh, how has your work in TV writing influenced your <coughs> work in novels? I think it's made it better, actually. Um, because I was joined up with a lot of writers on these projects, and a writer's room became sort of my um, my uh, graduate school, which I never went to, and and I never had anybody say to me that this isn't good or um, that's a stupid idea. You know what I mean? Never had that happen. And you got to have thick skin, but it's but it's um, it's advantageous to you as a writer. And I think what it did is if you look at some of my stuff uh, before then, it could get, it tended to get a little bloated and, um, and now it's much more stripped down and it's much leaner, you know, the sentences are leaner. Do you hear David Simon in your head when you're Oh no, he's not, a, he's not really a fiction writer. But do you hear him <laughs> shorter, George? Short. <laughs> well, the, some of the things that we would say in, in, this, in the writer's room was always, um, that's too on point. That was a big thing in our in the writers' room. It's too on point, meaning it's too obvious, and um, so that's something that I always remember. Um, or that's a coincidence, dick. You know, it's like that. That's bullshit. It's a, it's a coincidence. You can't do that. Just because it's a TV show, you can't. I will often turn to my wife and say, "Why did that?" You know, she'll say to me, "Why did they say that?" And I said, "Because it's a TV show. <laughs> Not because they would ever say it in life." And, and that goes for exposition too. Exposition is a real big trap. How do you get um, how do you get the information across without being expository? And so you really got to work on this stuff. Uh huh. Um, so in the writers' room, are you working on a finished script that you're all revising, or like, no? Um, you're, you're just you're bouncing around ideas, and then when you get more specific, you actually beat out uh, the script scene by scene together as a group. And it's called a beat sheet. When you walk out of there, you walk out with a beat sheet with about 35 beats, which are scenes. And they're in order. And, and there's a board, um, a bulletin board with index cards on it. And it's day one, night one, day two, night two. All the scenes are in order. And then they're color coded by character. So that when you look at the board, you can see that Omar, the drug dealers, the police, the district attorney, they're all fully represented by looking at the colors on the board. That's how it works. Okay. How do you keep the chronology of, like, if you're writing a book about the grandfather of a character who's going to have his own book later on, mm -hmm. how much, how, like, how do you keep that straight when you're doing several books later? Do you remember, even, like, what cigarettes somebody's smoking or? Yeah, well, I have to go back and, and find the passages in, in the book. I do have a lot of files in my office on, um, the, I take a lot of notes. I have a pad where I work in front of the computer. I'm just writing stuff down about characters and things that I, want, I might want to remember later on. Like their chronologies? Yeah. 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 Do you have any advice on how to learn that exposition? Well, I think uh, revealing things through dialogue is one way. And, um, and, and action describes character if you want to get really deep about you know, the existentialist hero like Parker in the Richard Stark books is a perfect example. You don't know anything about Parker, really. He's a machine. But you know you know he's a badass. You know that he's, I mean, the, the perfect, the very first Parker book, um, it's a good example. He's walking over to George Washington Bridge, and he's, his arms are too long for his suit, and his wrists are raw bone and big, and he's, he's walking like a, like a panther walking out of the jungle or something. He's down. That's all he had to say. He didn't give him a backstory or anything like that. But you love it. Huh? But you love it. Well, yeah, and, and Lee Marvin was the perfect embodiment of um, Parker. <laughs> because he looks like that. You know, he had, Parker had a 
I mean, Lee Marvin had a, sort of a, a sway of a big cat. Okay. Do you try to limit the number of scenes where you get away from your protagonist to a certain amount? Um, I mean, you're, you're in his head all the time, but um, right. how careful are you about that? Uh, yeah, you don't want to get too far away from him, I don't think. Like, in this book, um, you don't meet the antagonists until well into the book when he discovers who they are. Then I cut to the next chapter where I'm just with them. They're getting ready to do a, um, to uh, beat up an old man for his, for his coins. And then, you know, that, now I'm with them. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to introduce them until Spiro Lucas found out who they were. Um, and in television, we call it point of view. And what, uh, on the shows that I've worked on, we only give uh, a certain amount of characters point of view. Let's say six or eight characters in The Wire and Treme had point of view, meaning we could never write a scene where one of those characters wasn't in the scene. Never. And it would really handcuff you sometimes because we wanted to. And then some smart ass in the room would say, he doesn't have point of view. He can't write that scene. And it, and it disciplines. Yeah, Jeff. Um, when uh, Laura said that to, to David about he doing uh, in Baltimore what you were doing in DC and sort of social issues, and I think your books are imbued with that sense, which is something I just wonder if you could address the issue of crime fiction and morality and social sort of things that are very clear, or let's say not clear, but at least part of your there was, uh, the question is about the social issues in the crime novel. I think, you know, a, a big influence for me and a lot of other writers was Richard Price when he came out with Clockers because that book sort of kicked the door in, in terms of that, uh, that subgenre of crime fiction where you could actually say something big about what was going on in, out in the streets and, um, and not lose track of telling the story, too. And, so uh, I did it for a long time, and these books are more um, straight ahead crime novels, I would say. Although the, you know, there will be a size where he's looking around and he'll think about something that he sees, which is just a small thing, such as gentrification or a change in city. Um, but you know, for me, I don't know. I don't know if I would go back to writing those kinds of books because after The Wire, I felt like we did it better collectively than I could ever do it by, my, by myself. <coughs> I really do. I think season four of The Wire with the kids, to me is, you know, that's what I've been trying to do in my books my whole career. And then we did it, you know, I've, I've taken some good shots at it, but I think we really did 100% successful in that season. Go back just for one second. When you said you were a, uh film major and then you took a crime fiction writing class. <clears throat> so what was it about, this is a very basic question, but what was it about crime fiction that, you, that attracted you that you wanted to do and that why you chose to do that? I had, I, the reason I wasn't much of a book reader is the books that were given to me in high school did not speak to my world at all. Being a, um, you know, a guy who grew up a you know, son of a diner owner, and all my friends were the same kind of guys. They were ethnic, and their fathers didn't wear ties to work pretty much. Is the best way I can describe it. It's not all of them, but most of them. So none of these books ever addressed that that I that I knew of. Of course, I found books later on that did. And um, but crime fiction did that because it was about everyday people. And they didn't always win. And a lot of American fiction is about people who win in, in some way. Or they've got money, they've got good jobs. Um, uh, and so that, it opened my eyes that there could be books that, uh, wrote, that were written about the people who I knew. And that's what attracted me to it, more than the crime fiction aspect of it, but I like having an engine to hang all this stuff on so that I can say what I'm trying to say. I would say we have another, uh, another one or two questions before we uh, <clears throat> take George in the back of the books. You okay. Do you yeah. use an outline? I do not. I, I didn't answer that gentleman's question fully. I never outlined. Never. No. Um, 
I have a situation, and then I just start writing, and I let the characters kind of tell the story once I figure out who they are. Um, and my books typically don't start with a murder and end with a solution to a murder. They're not mysteries. I'm proudly a crime novelist, but I don't really write mystery novels. So I don't need that, um, that format anyway. And sometimes murders don't occur. Sometimes they never occur in a book, or they only they occur 150 pages in. You know? um, yeah, I don't don't outline, but it's I, I don't recommend it. But I know, well, it's it's hard. It's always hard because you. Uh, but the funny thing about it is, is all the writers I know that I admire didn't outline either. Elmore Leonard never outlined. I don't think Stephen King outlines. Um, I think you just write, and then you discover the book as you write it, and that's what makes it fresh. Anybody else? All right, yes, sir. Have you ever set out to get from point A to Z, but then you got there in a completely different way because you don't plan out? Yeah. Um, the, here's a, the night garden was a book that gave the fence all the way to the end. I didn't know how that book was going to end until I was about 10 pages away from it. And I really struggled with that book a lot. I was under pressure anyway because I had a new big contract at the house, and, I, and you know, I was, it's the first time. It was the first time in my career that I've ever felt like this isn't gonna, this isn't going to work. And it was the hardest book I ever wrote, and I think it's one of the very best books I wrote. It did come to me, and the, and the weird thing is, is that I didn't have to go back and change too much. It was all there. It was always there. I had planted all these things in the book. I just had. To I just had to let it come. Yeah. Okay. Um, the I, reading about your meticulousness with research on the the city and what's going on at the times you're writing about. Do you ever come to a point where you say, "I really just need to make it up"? Do you really want it? Does it have to be set in that historic reality that you're always? It, it helps me to have a, a, a frame of realism. And uh, to the point where I make sure that, you know, if I say there's a, a White House with blue shutters on the corner of 9th and Euclid, you can be sure that there is, because I always check it. And like the guy in this book, I'm out on my bike a lot with my iPhone. I take a lot of pictures. I, um, there was a robbery in the cut that where they, they, he broke into a guy's house. And I went and found this house, and I, I went back in the alley, and I made sure that he could bust into this place in the middle of the day. You know, I checked out all the sight lines and everything. And, um, and occasionally people will call me or contact me and say, what, you put my house in your book. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, all right, uh, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it.